And the Muslim says, yes. He tells him to repent. And that's all. The missionary doesn't say anything else. He hopes now the Muslim is going to start thinking, well, now, wait a minute. Jesus never sinned, but Muhammad was supposed to repent. Maybe Jesus is better. He's hoping, but he doesn't dare say that. Because if he says that, if he says, do you know, a sinless man is better than a repentant sinner. If he dares to say that, he goes exactly against the teachings of Jesus. If he's foolish enough to say that, he goes exactly against the teachings of Jesus. My advice to Muslims, if somebody asks you those questions, you ask him to tell you the story of the prodigal son. Everybody knows the story in the Bible. You say, the story of the prodigal son, the young man who told his father, give me the money that I would get when you die. I want it now. And then he ran away and he spent it on terrible things. Ask him to tell you that story and tell you what is the lesson of that story. Because the lesson of that story involves the complaint of the other brother in the family, the good son. When the evil son came back and repented, the father welcomed him. And the good son complained. He said, I've never done anything wrong. And yet, look how you treat my brother, who was so bad. And his father told him how wrong an attitude that was. He said, your brother was dead, now he's alive. You see, the perfect man does not have any preference over the sinless man or the repentant sinner in Christianity. Make the missionary tell you the story of the lost sheep. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 18, verse 12, it starts. Jesus said, what do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray? Does he not leave the 99 on the hills and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, Truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. Jesus was trying to hammer that point home to his disciples, saying, don't you dare say because, for example, you've been a faithful follower for many years, that you're better than this one who just became a believer yesterday. The perfect man has no precedence over the repentant sinner. In fact, this whole argument would not exist if both Muslims and Christians were better aware of the meaning of the word sin, but that's another story and we don't have time for. To illustrate again, the missionary says to the Muslim, was Jesus the Messiah? And the Muslim says, yes. And the missionary says, was Muhammad the Messiah? The Muslim says, no. There he stops again, hoping the Muslim will go away and think, now, wait a minute, Jesus is Messiah, but Muhammad isn't. Maybe Jesus is better. Well, what you want to ask the missionary is about this word Messiah. Ask him. Jesus was the Messiah, but were there any other Messiahs besides Jesus? Now you find out how well he knows his Bible, because there were many. David, Solomon, even Cyrus the Persian were called Messiah. It's hard to find that in the Bible because the translators cover it over. They translate the word. Messiah means anointed. Somebody picked to do a job. Somebody single out said, you are the one. Every king of ancient Israel was called Messiah. Now the name doesn't look quite so special anymore. It is a title, but it does not particularly elevate to some divine status. I'm trying to show you that the arguments are not good enough that are being used and I see in print all the time. The missionary asks the Muslim, where's the body of Jesus? And the Muslim says, God took it. And the missionary says, where's the body of Muhammad? And the Muslim says, it's in Medina in the ground. The missionary stops, hoping the Muslim will go away and think, now that's interesting. The body of Jesus is gone. Muhammad is in the grave. Maybe Jesus is the true messenger, Muhammad is false. He's hoping you'll think that, but he dare not say it. Because what you want to ask the missionary, is that what you mean to say? Do you mean that a dead and buried prophet is a false prophet? Is that what you mean? Make him finish it. Because if that's what he means, what does he say about Abraham, for example? Or in Arabic they say Ibrahim. Jews and Muslims till now still go to the place where he's buried to visit his grave. Is he a false prophet because he's dead and in the ground? 
For that matter, where is the body of Moses? The Bible says God took it. He sent an angel to take the body away. What does it prove? What disturbs me most, I guess, because even now we're seeing finally a, a turnaround in the Pentecostal churches where for years the Pentecostal insisted you are saved not by works but by your faith. Pentecostal church is starting to finally put the two together. No, it's faith and works side by side. What the missionary has always accused the Muslim of is to say, you people believe you're saved by works alone. And they quote the Quran. In the 32nd chapter of the Quran, the 19th verse, or ayah, it says, if you'll excuse my terrible Arabic, Amaladina amanu wa amalu salihat falahum janatul mawa nuzalan bima kanu yamalun. Which means, and for those who believe and do good works, for them, gardens, a refuge, and entertainment for what they used to do. They quote this verse saying, you see, Muslims believe they're saved by works alone. Somehow, the word is there in print, they don't see it. It says, Amanu wa amalu salihat. Amanu, they believe wa amalu salihat, and they do good works. They believe and they do good works. The two are together. You see, in the Arabic language, the word only has to change a little bit, and it becomes a different part of speech. Amanu means they believe. Iman, made from the same letters, means what you believe, your belief, your faith. What this verse is saying is you've got to have faith and works side by side. Not one, not the other, but both. Which is exactly what is found in the Bible, in the little book of James, especially the second chapter of the little book of James. Now, the Protestant reformers at first didn't like James very much. Martin Luther said it was an epistle of straw. Blow it away. Didn't like it. In the second chapter of James, he makes the point several times, particularly in the 26th verse, he says to the Christian community, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. It's not faith or works, it's faith and works together. That's what the Muslim believes, that's what the book of James says. Don't tell the Muslim he believes he's saved by works alone. He doesn't believe it. And he only thinks you're foolish because you think that's what it says in the Quran when you quote it to him. So far, my points are simply these, that discussions about the sinless Jesus or Jesus the Messiah or Jesus taken into heaven or faith and works don't prove anything. They're not arguments that are going to lead somewhere. The complaint I have against Muslims is sometimes you let yourself be led around by the nose. Think! I'll just say, well, the man's an expert. I don't know. Think. It's not how much you know, it's what do you do with what you know, how much you use your head. Even the Bible tells people, let's reason together. God says, come let us reason together in the first chapter of Isaiah. Now, it is true that the Koran is very critical of some Jews and Christians, not all, some Jews and Christians. The Koran is critical of them. In the third chapter of the Quran, the third surah, beginning about the 77th verse, or ayah, it speaks of some among the Jews and Christians. It says, there is among them a group who distort the book with their tongues. You would think that it is part of the book, but it is no part of the book. And they say, that is from God, but it is not from God. It is they who tell a lie against God, and well they know it. Now the Muslim is familiar with this scripture from his book it says look some of the Jews and Christians lie about the contents of their book they distort it the Muslim has every reason to believe this is true when he just looks at what is offered in literature he goes into a bookstore that sells Bibles and he finds out there's so many different versions and if he looks carefully he sees that the newer Bibles leave out some of the words that are in the older Bibles and the newer Bibles have some words that aren't in the older Bibles. Something's going on that looks funny to him, and he thinks of this verse. Now, of course, someone is going to go away, many are probably going to go away, and say that I stood here and I insulted Bible translators because it's the translators of the Bible that do that. I'm not. I'll be happy to insult a few because they do this kind of thing. They're guilty of manipulation. 
But just as Jesus used to talk to a crowd of people, he told them what he wanted to tell them, and every so often he'd see someone in the audience, a Pharisee or somebody that was misleading the people, and he'd point him out and say, that one is a liar. He was not diplomatic. That's why he got into so much trouble from place to place. Because when he saw a liar, he pointed him out as such. I'm not going to do that, but I'm just showing you. If you speak harshly of someone, you're only following the example of Christ. He found that there was a time and a place to single out the people who led others into unbelief. You see, some translators of the Bible are honest. And they fight with their contemporaries over the proper translations to say, you've changed that, it should be this. They fight about it. Two of them, for example, are Goodspeed and Moffat. 